Welcome back to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have our practical lecture 10.1. And this goes a bit more into the understanding of deep learning models and actually how they relate to HPC environments. I will execute a couple of demonstrators on the HPC machines uh, that we have in the Yuli Supercomputing Center. But of course, one of the ideas of your final assignment in the course will be also that you get your hands dirty, of course, with deep learning models yourself. In order to do this, we have to understand the deep learning fundamentals first. And indeed, we had a first very in, in important ingredient to this deep learning fundamentals already in the last lecture. So let us review what we had the last time, which in a way can be seen as really one of the basic building blocks of neural networks still. Although, as we have seen, it was a very, let's say, trivial model we discussed. So in lecture 10, we put a bit the emphasis on classification. That is important. That means we have already labeled data sets. In other words, here, these points of data have already a group associated to each other. And what we want to do is machine learning and then deeper learning later in respect to classification is we want to get new points right. We want to understand can we do a decision rule? Can we do some machine learning system that automatically knows that this point is either belonging to this or that group? And we want to, of course, establish in a systematic fashion this kind of a systematic uh, machine learning system. Because if we don't have this automated, systematic created, uh, we want to not do it by ourselves and manually. Um, this would be meaning too much time. And with the automated algorithms we learn in this course here, starting already last time with the perceptron, what is actually worth doing the job, right? If you remember, we had the idea of differentiating as one concrete example of classification, this flower type, which could be this new data item I'm talking about we've never seen before, right? Which is here, the good question, is this particular flower now part of this particular a class of um, basically flowers or this class. And we have seen this is Iris setosa here. This is Iris virginica. And if you really look on the pictures, uh, you have seen it's really hard for a non-expert in flowers to really differentiate them. However, we also learned if you look basically on the attributes of your data set, what we had done here was really, let's, let's say just really bluntly putting it here on a interesting coordinate system, we see that, for instance, the peta width and the peta length here of these flowers can be actually used to plot already a certain group-like behavior. So obviously, there's a pattern to be detected here that basically we can maybe learn with a machine learning algorithm. And we have data, what we can do. The only point is also we have no physical formula, right, that basically implements now this question. So in a way, we need to find with another formula, this kind of decision boundary, which helps us to determine now the question, is this new point belonging e either to Iris virginica or Iris setosa? And this decision boundary should help with this. There are other machine learning elements we briefly covered, but we put the emphasis on classification in a supervised setup. That means we have an attribute vector here, X1, which is our data set with an associated label Y that makes it supervised, meaning that we have here the group already known for those samples we want to learn from. Still, the one that we never seen before, of course, doesn't have some of these labels. This is what we want to find out by basically putting it into the machine learning system. Now, by having these supervised, let's say, environment, we learned there's one interesting algorithm from the 60s even we can use. And this goes back really to this interesting learning model, the perceptron that is going back to Rosenblatt, actually in the 1957 time frame. And basically, this was the idea of creating a machine learning model a little bit like the neuron in a human brain. So we see this a little bit here modeled. We have different stimulus that will activate basically certain weights or learned weights, really. Uh, which are modeled after the human brain. You know, we had the last time the idea with synapses, etc. But here we want to directly go to the machine learning model. And we have always a certain bias, which of course translate, if you know a little bit about 
basically the idea of how a line in space is created, you can see that this bias, of course, can help to shift the line away in this space up and down, for instance. So by thinking about the bias, however, um, and we don't know where it is in the space, we make it learnable too. In other words, this is red. And this is something what the machine learning system needs really to learn from the data set, right? Because the data set x1, x2, x3, up to the dimension of the features I have in such a vector here, um, I basically see that as constants, right? So this is the data we have. And of course, also the guiding y on the other hand that we can have here, this is also something known in a way also constant. The only element we have to learn is now this basically, um, you know, sum them up these different stimulus through these different attributes, um, you know, summed up linearly using weights that makes it a linear learning model. That is the sum sign here. Also here, a bit compact notation. This W again is basically the learnable parameters you see here, the different weights, but of course also the bias, which we model here a little bit as a threshold that we of course in more compact ideas can also put inside the learning vector W. In order to derive a class, we have seen there's a sign function, which is a very trivial, let's say, initial activation function of sort that we always have, basically close to one of these ideas of a neuron that we will pick up later today. And then by always picking one item, we see here a little bit the um, you know, illustration of the perceptron learning algorithm, which goes together with the perceptron learning model, by iterative picking those and updating or subtracting the vector y, we can actually basically come to a line that converges, but only if the data like here in this example is linearly separable. So you see here a linear decision boundary, which we can strike through the data in order to get all the samples right, because otherwise the algorithm will never converge. Only basically if all um, are ex actually correctly classified, I can then converge with the PLA with the perceptron learning algorithm. Also here you see that in the example, it's very nice um, to have here this decision boundary. However, take away the message that in practice, unfortunately, this linear separability is not always the case. Hence, we need more advanced algorithms. We need more advanced models. I showed you last time also the Paul vector machines, which kind of do the doctor uh, the the kind of idea uh, very robust by allowing basically some error to happen so even if some blue points would be on the other side here or red points would be on the other side here depending on the costs that i have associated with the support vector machines it still finds an ideal line to basically provide a good decision boundary for us even if the data is not linearly separable so it will be still high accuracy when i see probably new points arriving and this is, of course, a very, let's say, rough introduction to machine learning. Um, obviously, a real course on machine learning is something I would recommend to you. Here we talk about machine learning because we have entered the second part in the course where we, let's say, here and there talk briefly really about the different application areas that take advantage of HPC. And one prominent example, that's why we spent a bit more slides on that, is really deep learning and machine learning these days. But we will come also to computational fluid dynamics, physical models, or Earth system models later, as you see here also in our second part of the course, where we have different application domains. Just because machine learning is also nice and deep learning to show you the advances in GPUs as well, um, it's a very nice topic. And of course, there are lots of jobs in the field right now where we're missing experts. So another idea of putting then a short emphasis on. However, if you want to really understand all the details, including regularization, validation, all important topics, I really recommend you to become an expert rather in the proper data science course, machine learning course. We also offer deep learning courses at the University of Iceland. That's really something uh, where you have to head on next if you are interested in this topic. So today it's really more a practical topic. So I stopped talking too much about what we did before and connect rather how we build on it. We basically look very shortly back to the perceptual learning algorithm, just really to put it to the next level inside the so-called multi-layer perceptron. 
in other words, also an artificial neural network, which goes with a certain learning algorithm, not anymore this interesting one that you learned with the perceptron learning algorithm, but here we're talking about backpropagation of error. And there we need a different aspect to it, which um, helps us to understand how that works. And this is optimization techniques. So how you learn this optimization will be also important part of it. But we establish this gradually. We really want to start with, again, the linear setup that we had and then want to understand a bit how also the growth of the parameters then more and more require really the use of HPC and GPUs in particular. However, this is better understood when we come to the second part of the course where the parameters and the, let's say, degrees of freedom where you can choose from architectures in CNNs and convolutional neural networks really will explode. So we will learn that the step from shallow learning to deep learning is quite intensive when it comes to computational aspects. And that's why basically the statement goes, deep learning is only feasible if you have really HPC today or GPU resources at your hand, especially if you talk about cutting edge ResNet models, cutting edge models that are used in deep learning also for languages, GPT models. They have lots of lots of parameters that with CPUs, you don't really want to train them. Hence, we talk about different complexities like hyperparameter tuning. And then, of course, also the, the interesting architecture of a so-called convolutional neural network architecture, which is one of the basic architectures, which I will roughly introduce again. Here, the disclaimer goes for both topics, really, artificial neural networks and convolutional neural networks. They are presented here in the light to really use them with HPC resources to understand why computing is an impact there. But on the other hand, also, it is not a fully course on artificial neural networks, which probably take uh, at least two lectures just to have the chain rule with backpropagation right, to understand convolutional neural networks really in all details with feature maps. I do, however, present you with some graphical insights and an interesting website where you can get the main message. But again, as disclaimer, please, if you're interested in these topics, you need to study a complete proper machine learning course. So. <clears throat> However, by basically having going through this particular part of the lecture, you have really um, parallel computing understood on different levels. We will go to Jupyter at JC, which is a different way of how you use parallel computing on a HPC resource, because before you always had the batch scripts in your different assignments. Now we talk about more interactive access to HPC machine and with this also, of course, thinking about Python environments and not any more C that you had before. So in a way, also use different programming paradigms in HPC resources. Coming now then to the first topic, artificial neural networks and its basics. And here we also would say, um, in particular light of this course lecture here, we want to stay with the supervised learning set up and I told you already in the refresher for the last lecture. Um, this means largely that I have my data sets in this particular format, that I always have this input vector with all the different attributes or features. And then I have one guiding output for this vector that says it's this or that class. Of course, we always had two classes only. We will see now in this lecture how we basically go and extend this to multi-class setups. And also connecting back to what we had the last time, the neuron or basically the perception then that we modeled as a machine learning system or model was then basically able to provide us with a machinery that then can do the decision for us and says that this particular flower is definitely an iricitosa because it's on this part of the decision boundary. And we modeled that with this particular idea of a perceptron model um, which we will extend today that I, I present this a little bit in a way as a, as a general mathematical notation for one neuron. So we said the bias was the threshold, if you remember, but we also said we can put it one as a constant here because we, when we multiply it with one, we can also learn it. And in this way, we put it into the vector of the learnable weights that were all the different connections, if you remember, to the input stimuli of this vector x. So, and if we basically element wise multiply it with these different weights that we got right from the perceptron and add this bias, 
and we have this sum available, we put it to a so-called non-linear activation function usually. Now, last time we put it through the sine function to get plus and minus one to get to the desired output, which was a very simple scenario. But today we will see that there are many different activation functions that we can use. However, the key principle to have this as a linear combination of the input data here available, um, this is basically something which is shared really with cutting edge deep learning, um, which you then have to put through this nonlinear activation function to make it more interesting. And a more compact notation is, as we learned also last time, we have this vector x transpose w, which basically just um, transforms then this kind of uh, notation a little bit into a more compact notation. We still have our w weights that we want to learn. And this is basically how it looks like when you see that the transpose is, is working on this particular day that they then can element wise multiply these two vectors. So in, in this sense, um, we can have here the sum away by just having a plus over here and this transpose that we basically have here as an indicate of um, basically here in this particular case vector vector multiplication or it is also known as a dot product. So this is more for the mathematical convenience why we do this. So also because of saving place. So let us come now to the next step of thinking about a much more complex problem that we had before. Still, it is one on one computer science in terms of machine learning. It's really a very simple um, idea how to use machine learning. <coughs> so here we see handwritten digits um, from, you know, 10 classes. In other words, the characters zero to nine. And we have here a data set available, which is 60,000 training samples and 10,000 test samples. And you see, as they are handwritten, they're always a little bit different from each other. And that is something which a tool called Keras has already basically available for us because it's in a way a nice teaching or a nice benchmark data set that you have available here. So, and we were gonna use this also in our assignment basically to understand it. Uh, we want to go a little bit into it and see um, what is now the encoding of this. And with this, I'm also starting a little bit here, um, now going also to the practicals. So we have a data set, which essentially, or basically let me go to this Jupyter JSC page that you see right now. You see, I have here on the deepest dump some Jupyter running. I have here a machine learning GPU partition where something is running for 180 minutes on one node only for me, that's enough. I already started this for you here to save some time because we don't have the time to really go through all of this. And you see here essentially the interesting code from analyzing this particular MNIST data set. So first, as the slide suggested, we imported from MNIST. We want to plot some interesting numbers. That's why we included this particular lib. And one important aspect is also then um, what I show later that we have a specific kernel to implement this, to have the right versions of TensorFlow and Keras available. From actually uh, the new TensorFlow version, there's also Keras inside. In previous version, you have seen Keras stands alone, but now TensorFlow actually comes with Keras. So let me execute this so that you see it was executing before also quite nicely. Um, just to repeat here a little bit the practicals for you. Um, then we load the data, data set, the MNIST load data here gives us also the opportunity in Python nicely to already differentiate between the so-called training set and test set. So we train the machine learning on this and then validate or check our results on the test set. And you see here the difference between X, which is of course the pixels that I have in this handwritten image, and then the guiding Y, which is a label. Right, which says it's a zero, it's a one, it's set something like this. So let's execute this again, it's loaded. Then we can basically here have again the dimensions of the data, 28 by 28 pixels. We have 60,000 the training set, 10,000 the test set. And of course for Y we have the same situation. For every basically image we have from the 60,000, we have a guiding Y that tells us then is it this or that class. So it's a 10 class classification problem. And when you really want to 
look a little bit into it, how it looks like, you can see it here in this particular plot, really, and um, have this then actually shown um, basically here as the images. And let us quickly go back. Um, and of course, you will also execute that yourself in the Jupyter JSC environment on the HPC machine. Obviously, we do here more or less a data inspection, so nothing really is computation expensive right now. We come to this later. But the first thing to understand is, again, the connection that we had also the last time. We again have the situation that we have training examples, and we cut this into training set and test set. Because we're in the supervised environment, we have this guiding Y. So you see for every of these pixel values, 28 by 28, you have the grayscale here for the images, of course, <coughs> that then basically make up the number. But also for this, you would say it's a five, it's a zero, right? And here's a, it's a two, it's a four. So we definitely have the label, what people have done so, and we try to learn from this basically with the machine learning system. And we use TensorFlow for it. Um, when we go for artificial neural networks, um, basically these days there's PyTorch is also a strong package. And as I also said, um, basically Keras is often used at a more intuitive layer-wise idea of how you can basically create neural networks on top, what we will see later. And basically now step-by-step step by extending our little perception to actually different types that make up in the end an artificial neural network. But the tool set we use from the implementation point of view is TensorFlow and Keras that you will also use basically in your assignment. For those of you who want to experiment a little bit, and some of you already have been part of my cloud course, there we used a little bit this collaboratory cloud infrastructure, which is also very well suited, but of course doesn't really scale very high to different GPUs for high performance computing. That's the difference of going basically to the Google Collaboratory, which is more cloud infrastructure, or you basically go to a Jupyter JC, where you will have really the opportunity then with Horovod, which will be actually shown by Rocco then in Practical Lecture 10.2, to really scale up using 100 and more than 100 GPUs in parallel, for instance, for one problem. However, also here, take away the message of costs, although it's free, a pro version makes sense if you work with it more let's say uh, more often, but again, you have also a limit in scaling. So for scientists, usually we have I don't know, our centers, which provides us with the same infrastructure like a Jupyter model that you will see in, all, in order to execute this, which you already have seen here. Here and there, the concrete course code elements might vary a little bit or the look and feel, mostly because we're going here through different versions every now and then or through different systems. At the key messages you see here is essentially the same. I was just alluding to here. Format is 28 by 28 pixels. Here we're going through different um, of these handwritten characters and then just print them. Um, important is here that we use X train. So that's what you basically have seen, um, which means in other words, it's the real character pixel wise, while there's a guided output Y for the training which all say, says which label it is. It's a zero, it's a five, etc. And that's what I just represented and basically presented to you. I also said the kernel is very important to choose and you will see depending on where you go in the Jupyter environment on the Google Collab or on the Jupyter notebooks that we have basically in JC here, it's a very important part of it. Um, you see here, we have this deep learning kernel but we have many kernels available. You see, I experimented a bit here with different deep learning kernels. And then, of course, also, um, you know, very specific one for quantum computing or so, uh, which is goes a little bit beyond the idea of our, um, you know, kind of lecture today. But of course, it's directly associated with our high performance computing elements. So, how we model this now with the perceptron, you can understand we have a 2D problem which needs to be 1D because the perceptron was just a one dimension. So we have to reshape what you have seen to make it a long vector version. Uh, some call it also vectorize the input. By vectorizing, we're losing a little bit the context information, right? Because we have one long vector now of the input, which comes from these pixels. We don't have this closed set up anymore and probably there is a hint that we maybe 
if we can preserve that in deep learning later with a convolutional neural network, we get better accuracy than we have to do today, basically now in this first part, when we vectorize the percept to, to actually stick it to a perceptual learning model. Now, this looks then more like this. We have a three, 784 input pixel value, which is actually the same, but of course now vectorized. Um, then what usually is done also, we normalize here and there the pixels to become, let's say between zero and one, for instance, to, to counter some effects like basically raising numbers while learning and so on. It also goes a little bit outside the idea of this particular um, course. <coughs> However, what you then um, try to do here is the next step, instead of using the normal perceptron that we had here and then sum up these different um, ideas with the neurons, um, we had just one neuron the last time. And here we can basically use 10 perceptrons for 10 outputs because we have a 10 class problem, right? So that's why we need 10 outputs. And instead of just, you know, having a sine function plus or minus one, we need some output probabilities here to understand, is it this or that or that class? And by doing so, we can model this nicely in this Keras model here. Um, I don't provide now a demonstration in particular on this one, but you see um, you have a model sequential, then you add a dense layer, a fully connected layer here with a number of classes and our long vector that we reshaped here. And add a so-called activation function called softmax, which is now going beyond what we learned before with the sine function, but really gives us output probabilities essentially for these different um, signals that come up. So I still sum up linearly using these weights that we learned, but instead of put using the sine function, I use now basically this particular softmax function. However, what we also learn is now instead of having one perception, we have to do this a couple of times more, right? So 10 times more plus 10 biases means we have already learnable parameters, which are you know, around 8,000. Now, by doing so, you need basically an optimizer to really um, essentially now do this step and learn from all the data. And what you basically do there is you take the derivative, um, a mechanism called stochastic gradient descent or gradient descent, which is a, a very established optimization technique. So in order to find from the, basically from a function, then the gradient, you um, the basically the slope, you take the gradient and basically you will notice that you essentially you're going downhill by having, let's say a stationary one here or the basically the gradient will indicate to which direction you probably have to move in order to go downhill here. And by this, you minimize the error over time. Um, and by iteratively doing this step by step by step, you usually come, come to a kind of convergence. Of course, this convergence could be a local minima, not so global as you see it right now. And this could be a real problem, but that's why we have sometimes learning rates to jump across local minima. But these are all basically problems you should have in a proper, let's say, a machine learning course discussed. So here you see basically in order to find out the new position here, we basically take the old position where we are on this particular, take the derivative um, basically of this particular function at a particular position. And here is this learning rate I was alluding to. And of course here, because a gradient will give us the, you know, the accent, we want to have a gradient descent. We do a minus, right? This gradient team in order to land hopefully at the next position here that you see here nicely, which is downhill. And there are different loss functions where you can use this particular system with. Um, you see here one particular one, which is well suited for categorical data sets. What we have here right now, we have basically a zero to nine category in classes, there you can use the categorical cross entropy as a last function in order to use it with an optimizer. And you can pick the optimizer also from Keras, all this is nicely given to us. And you combine this here basically with the, um, with the model parameters. We did a certain epochs, how often you go through the data set in order to solve this problem. Then in each of the epochs, you pick the certain batch size. So how many of the data you take it once before you make updates. 
built on this optimization. Um, number of classes is here 10, of course, because we have a 10 class problem. Then this is what I already was, you know, demonstrating, loading the data in a training and test set. And this includes also the guiding label Y. We have a reshape because we want to vectorize. We want to here just basically normalize a little bit, as I said, to, to really have numbers between zero and one, for instance, that is better for our uh, model training. And essentially then have a source code ready from the data perspective point of view. And what now comes is, of course, building our multi-output perceptron model on top of this, where we essentially build a sequential model in Keras. And on this, we add a dance class, as we have seen, based on the number of classes, which was 10. And then basically the input shape is the all long vector, which was, you know, 700 something. We add the softmax activation function. And then with the model summary, you can just have some output. You compile this, which means you add the optimizer SGD, as we learned, but also then this categorical cross entropy loss function that we have here, which is just well suited for these particular problems. And with this, we fit the model over the number of epochs we have specified. And by doing this, basically the data set and the machine learning system will now epoch by epoch go through the data set, batch size by batch size and perform optimization. And by doing iteratively doing this, we basically calm down the error you see here with the number of iterations. And the same is then when we test it, usually on the test examples. However, here is also a very important part overfitting. When you come to the idea in the future that you want to learn machine learning, it's very important to understand that overfitting is one of the biggest problems we have in machine learning. To fight it with regularization validation would be topics you need to learn in a machine learning course. You see here a little bit how that looks like. So when you overfit the data, you definitely have the error quite okay because you fit regularly every um, basically data point within samples. So basically within our data set we have seen. For unseen samples, it would be terrible, right? So that would be always probably misclassified. So the optimum would be rather something in between we strive for. Um, on the other hand, when we basically stop, you know, too early to learn, we would underfit. And then we have a very trivial model where the error is still very high. So finding the balance here is a key element in machine learning and alludes to techniques like validation and regularization techniques that usually should be studied. However, by running these examples, you will see we have an error rate of, let's say, 92 accuracy, right? 92% accuracy, which is not that bad. So in other words, this multi-perceptron or multi-output perceptron already does a very good job. But can we improve it? So here the idea is basically by improving it, um, can we add more layers? So what could we do? Maybe hidden layers to it, um, you know, more perceptron combined to it, um, another activation function to it maybe. So you see also sometimes 92, sometimes 91. That's a bit the iterative approach in numerical instability, more or less in the, in the gradient descent and the optimizers and so on. But in the end, it converges roughly into the same. If you want to make it right, you have to do it 10 times and then take the average perhaps. But we skip that here a little bit. However, we notice there's maybe room for improvement when we go to the artificial neural network way, which brings us also to the key idea of knowing now multi-layer perceptrons. You see here um, the idea of using just one perceptron and its limitation called the XOR problem. With one line, you cannot solve this data set, which has, you know, the same class on the opposite sides here. So whatever line you, you try to find with a machine learning system will always fail. So in, in other words, what you could smartly do is combining those lines with a multi-layer perceptron now by combining those, as you see a little bit here in the so-called hidden layer, in order to do different lines, and they actually complement each other. And by this, you really can solve this XOR problem and have a much more powerful model at hand. And then by adding even non-linear activation functions, you remember this building block here that I had outmarked that we started from the sine function, but now basically have G, and G could be an activation function for many of those, sigmoid, tanj, the rectified linear unit is very popular right now, or leaky relu really. 
So all different, let's say, ideas, how you take the signal that is still the linear, you know, sum, uh, simmed up linear using weights, you put that into this different activation function for what you have to choose. And then you come to very nice nonlinear decision boundaries you see here, which then, of course, hopefully don't overfit your data set. We will discuss it later, but still can recreate arbitrarily complex function in order to catch nonlinearities, um, basically, basically with this linear ingredient that you see linear in weights, but using the nonlinearities here in the activation function will then solve these limitations. So very sweet material. That's why artificial neural networks is usually teached in two or three lectures. I bring you a very smart, quick brush of the idea how it works. So you go with the input signals, you do the same thing we just alluding to and sum up linear using weights, but step by step from the hidden layers until the essentially last layer, which is the output layer, which was our guiding why that is coming out here. And here we would say we have just probabilities usually given the softmax activation function here. And there's a so-called winner takes all decision rule, right? So that we have a class estimate for the pattern X at the end. However, because we cannot compare with the error here, simply because this we are far in the deep learning network, there was a so-called back propagation of error where you basically then go back with the error in order to understand and by this also understand and doing the weight update rules here. Um, as I said, very complex to understand just in a short lecture like this. In all, in all of these, you pr probably do an initial weight update or basically initialization of random weights. You loop until convergence, taking this, deliver, um, this derivative as I meant with a whole amount of, you know, the derivatives in this vectors, which makes it really then the overall gradient. And in each of these steps in this loop, you have to update these weights based on what we learned with the learning rate, right? And we see derivative, um, which is then the minus, because of course we don't want to have an ascent, we want to have the gradient descent. And then basically by, by using this optimization function, you will see here different parameters, um, you go downhill the error, so to speak, in order to find the minimum of error. And by this picking then those um, essentially learned weights that then, of course, in 3D here are OK to understand or 2D really in a way. But um, then here, um, you know, you can see that's really the limits in humans. Think about that, of course, we would have much more weights to think about. It goes beyond 3D. So. Also here you see the effect of the initial guesses and then the small learning rate will never reach this particular you know, minima, while the big learning rate, you're jumping back and forth, will also not reach essentially then this the minima and also only stable learning rates will converge then smoothly, smoothly, step by step, iteratively to this minima. Also, this is a very established technique, so I don't, you know, will introduce that too much. Um, here in the course, let us come to this artificial neural network so that we also can essentially a little bit demonstrate here in the particle lecture to get your head started, essentially, when we talk about um, then your assignment. And you see here, again, the idea of um, basically having Keras used from TensorFlow these days. So we also added here the device lab because we want to understand a little bit about the GPU setup that we have on this particular node here, which was basically our machine learning, um, you know, basically partition that is essentially seeing here four GPUs available, which are all Tesla V100s. So this means our kernel, everything has been correctly set up and will be also available to you in your assignment. But of course, for deep learning, it is essential and for neural network learning, which is still in shallow networks here, it might be still beneficial to have those GPUs. So this is important, we have the GPUs, so let us continue loading the training data, which we had done before. And also basically, as we had it before in the multi-output perceptron, we again have to flatten this long vector because also the neural network takes a long network, a long vector basically as an input. So here, nothing changed really. The only big change, of course, will come when we think about here having two dense layer, 
which means we have you know the number of input pixels and here the idea of the dimension of pixels and we put an activation function called relo in the game and then instead of having then the complete output with softmax uh, directly in that layer we basically have another dense layer uh, which is here the normal layer then which prevents us um, basically from having um, uh, you know basically just one layer so here we talk about a multi-layer artificial neural network and we have a different optimizer called adam for instance also here we can use sgd but we still have the same loss function as before so here we defined a very let's say baseline neural network model and when you get your hands on in your assignment you will see um, you can play around with these kind of different parameters and then make a different model so let us fit the model here where you see now a very big impact of these gpus and your assignment will also uh, make you use this with CPU. So you will see that the timing for this will be much, much more slower when using CPUs compared to GPUs. Just a final score of error, which is not that bad, but you see already here with 98% validation accuracy, um, we are already better than we were before with the multi-output perceptron, if you remember. In a way, that's also what I, what's standing here. You have basically different, um, you know, dense areas here. What I did, I put the activation directly inside in this source code I showed, um, but still the same message remains that you have basically now a full blown hidden neural network with different activation function, non-linear activation functions. And then in the end, you always need the softmax that is basically sitting here and giving you output probabilities which of the you know numbers it is basically from zero to nine and here we have the winner takes all rule who then says the biggest probability will be reported <coughs> of course here in assignment three you will do that yourself a little bit again when you work on this make sure you have the right kernel and this will be a very part of the assignment also to learn about this kernel and picking them so don't worry about this but by doing this maybe with two hidden layers you already get an accuracy on this MNIST data for, let's say, 97%. And that's not bad. However, as you've seen in computing, perhaps not fully, because here we have now um, different GPUs available to doing this, but our parameters already exploded. If you remember, we had 8,000 in the multi-output perceptron. Now we talk about 120,000 roughly in this neural network setup. But of course, we improve with this to 95%, maybe sometimes a bit more, uh, just by using more EPOS, maybe if you learn. But otherwise, um, we see here a huge increase in computing all of these different weights in the network of learning them. So let's have a short summary per video. And I do understand, of course, for everyone, it's a very fast walking through this. I again encourage you to have a really proper deep learning course to really learn about these topics. This is a nice summary before we break for the second part of the course. This is a simulation of a single biological neuron. Information flows in, is processed by the neuron, and the results flow out. This gives the neuron its abilities to react based on previously learned patterns. Technology duplicates this by creating a structure that processes information like a biological neuron does, except this process is mathematical instead. Just like the biological neuron, information flows in, is processed by the artificial neuron, and the results flow out. This single process becomes a mathematical formula that can be used for simple problems. For those that are mathematically inclined, this will look similar to a polynomial. A polynomial is limited to the problems it can solve for, as shown in this graph of an order 5 polynomial. If this is all artificial intelligence could do, it wouldn't be much use. As with a brain, artificial neural network's power is in connecting sets of neurons together in layers. When you connect them in layers, the mathematical formula becomes something like a multi-dimensional polynomial. This allows complex problems, like what is shown in this graph, to be discovered and used for our benefit. As before, information flows in and results flow out, but this time the input to the second layer is from the output of the first layer. 
The exact steps for a single layer are simply repeated for each layer of the neural network. Okay, so let's come back. <clears throat> Obviously, we want to maybe increase our performance by using deep learning techniques, and we will see how that materializes when I come to the second part of the course using so-called convolutional neural networks after a short break. <laughs>